Hi all. Good evening and a very warm welcome uh, to this uh, scientific webinar. And uh, I especially would like to welcome all the participants for the day who have joined in and uh, the, all the speakers, all the four speakers who have joined in. And of course, our Nestle team members who are logged in for this scientific event. Thank you so much for making it. And uh, a special thanks to the speakers uh, for making it uh, uh, on time uh, in despite their busy schedule. So I'm Raghu. Uh, I'll be the host for the for the evening to take you through through the proceedings for the day. Um, just to get a little thought on uh, Nestle, uh, I think all of you know Nestle's uh, commitment on nutrition is uh, unparalleled. And uh, Nestle Health Science, uh, in fact, uh, is the specified high-end research uh, solution partner for for doctors and uh, and this topic today is really encouraging for us to be partnering with so uh, nestle health science uh, we are committed to defining the management of uh, health and we offer extensive solutions in different uh, disease specific conditions so uh, today's topic especially which is on sarcopenic obesity which is the undiagnosed burden i think that's the uh, the key uh, uh, theme of uh, this today's topic is something which is very relevant and we are very sure all of you will enjoy uh, and learn quite a lot on this new emerging science and uh, the, the the reason being that uh, we all have heard about sarcopenia uh, in cancer and the prevalence of obesity as well. But the fact is today's topic is going to govern on covering obesity in cancer patient and weight loss through nutritional intervention and oncobariatric surgery as well. So the critical point that will be covered by the speakers across will be on reversal and remission as well. Uh, the rules for the for today's event uh, is you have the chat box. Uh, you can share your uh, questions over there, and uh, the all the questions will be answered by the end of the program. Uh, we have four speakers for the day. Uh, to start with, the first talk uh, will be by Dr. Prabhu Nesargikar. Uh, Sudeshna, can I have uh, Dr. Prabhu's uh, video online? Hi, Doctor. Good evening. Thanks Good evening. for joining. Yeah, just to introduce Dr. Prabhu to all of you, uh, Dr. Prabhu uh, Nesargikar, uh, he's a consultant, upper GI cancer and bariatric surgeon at uh, HCG Hospital Bangalore. And uh, he did his MD at uh, UK MRCS at uh, MRCS at England and quite a set of repertoire of skills which he has uh, and uh, set of awards as well from Korean Gastric Cancer Congress, Japanese Gastric Congress, and of, of course from NHS Scotland Leadership and Management Program as well, which he has completed. And he's a ace shuttle player as well. So, sir, we welcome you to this uh, program and uh, uh, and uh, please the stage is yours on this topic, which you're going to talk on sarcopenic obesity, the undiagnosed burden. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, so hi, uh, good evening to all and welcome to this uh, interesting discussion. I think we were having chat with National Health Science for the past few uh, uh, months about how to uh, set up a presentation which sort of is current and uh, which obviously we'll all be seeing in your uh, practice. So how I've structured the talk and then each speaker will possibly have an element of what is all important. So hopefully by the end of the whole uh, lecture series, you might have a better idea of uh, what we're talking about and why is it important in the current climate. Uh, so as uh, as Raghu mentioned, so thanks for Nestle Science for having us. So I'm a consultant upper GI and bariatric surgeon at uh, HCG. And today's talk is going to be about sarcopenic obesity. Uh, so, so the first thing, uh, so this is a case I have at the moment with me. So this is the patient, obviously the picture is taken from Google, but I couldn't take the Indian picture. So she's a 46 year old woman. Her BMI is 46, so she had a previous breast cancer uh, two years ago, and now she's been newly diagnosed with endometrial cancer. So if you look at her, you think obviously she's obese, but also you think she's healthy. Now, what has changed in the last 20 years? So this is the conundrum we are all facing. Uh, so when I was growing up as a medical student, if anyone said it's a cancer patient, you'll always look at the picture at the left. They're very sarcopenic, kikectic, and almost sort of dictum says that, oh, these looks like cancer patients. But now we know, now almost, uh, more than 30 to 40 percent of the world is now overweight, heading, obesity is the biggest epidemic. And now we're getting these patients who are obese. So the conundrum exists that, OK, are they sarcopenic? Are they obese? And how do we approach these patients in cancer care? Uh, because our focus is going to be on cancer patients specifically. But sarcopenic obesity is also seen in elderly gentlemen, which I'll briefly touch upon. 
So just let me get our uh, definitions right. So as you all know, sarcopenia is a Latin word. Sarco means muzzle, penia means loss. So depletion of skeletal mass muscle and function that negatively affects health is called sarcopenia. So that's a picture you can see of a very uh, sarcopenic kinetic gentleman. Uh, by definition, there are lots of definitions for sarcopenia. But one of the standards used, which Dr. Shukama is going to cover, is the skeletal mass index. Uh, and the number is, is, is highlighted there, less than 38.5 women and less than 52.4 for men. Uh, but obviously, it is a radiological diagnosis and it's good to talk more about that. Uh, now, other aspect is obesity. Uh, obesity needs actually no definition. Uh, obesity means accumulation of excess body fat. What has changed in the last few years is the standard WHO definition was greater than 30. So body mass index greater than 30 was considered as obesity in the rest of the Western world, even in UK and, uh, where I worked. Uh, but now it has gone to 25 in India. The reason being that in Asian population, we have seen that people with this lower BMI have higher comorbidities. So India is the diabetic capital of the world. So people with lower BMI, this is being affected. So the consensus is coming out soon that we possibly should start uh, calling obesity class one from a BMI greater than 25. So now this is a picture which, uh, which accurately represents what exactly is sarcopenic obesity. So yellow means fat, red means uh, the lean mass. So if you look at the picture, so A and B, so you can see the A picture, they're all obese individuals, but they all have different uh, muscular pattern in them. So if you see the first on the left, that's a patient obese with a low mean mass, which we call sarcopenic obese. So though we see, you know, remember saying everyone who's fat, we had a dictum in India that people who are fat are actually well fed. That is it's, it's the other way around. Now they're becoming more sarcopenic. And same, uh, if you look at the section B, Again, we have uh, three uh, pictures which are seen. Again, normal picture of an equal distribution between the fat and the lean mass. But as you go to the extreme, you've got now morbidly obese patients with lean muscle mass. So now the prevalence rate. Now, as I said, sarcopenic obesity is quite, it's been there around 20 to 25 years when I worked in Edinburgh. One of the professors who worked in one of the pioneers for sarcopenic uh, diagnosis and management. Uh, but it is not very well researched or very well uh, spoken about. So if you look at the prevalence rate, as I said, in cancer patients, it's anywhere between 9% in men to 18% in female. Uh, again, because it is not very well. So it's just the tip of the iceberg. But if you look at the elderly population, so in the Western world, it's nearly 15 to 20% of the Western cohort. In Asia, as I said, in India is a huge country, so we were not entirely sure how many people are actually sarcopenic obese, but we know there's a huge obese population, and there are lots of people who will be sarcopenic in that as well. So as I said, so this is what the, the problem with having sarcopenic obesity is. So what happens if you're sarcopenia, so your muscle weakness, muscle mass loss, it leads to decline in your physical activity. And that leads to decreased energy expenditure and increased insulin resistance. On the contrary, when you have obesity, increase in abdominal fat, increases the insulin resistance again. And there's a host of uh, mediators which come in, which also affects sarcopenia. But the end points, when the sarcopenia and obesity are mixed in the, as a cocktail in the same glass, then the, that's where the concoction happens. You know, there are increased cardiomyopathic disease, there are increased mortality, and there's increased physical disability. So recognition of or unrecognition of either one of those components can create problems going forward. So this was possibly a seminal paper which where all sarcopenic obesity started. So this is a paper from America published in NEGM, which is the highest impact factor journal in the world. So they followed nine, almost a million adults who were free of cancer at the time of enrollment in 1982. So they followed patients and then they, in this cohort, they had 57,000 deaths. So when they analyzed the deaths among the people who had, so if your BMI is greater than 40, so imagine they use BMI 40, not BMI 30. So the, the chances of if you are obese, BMI 40, you have 52 higher chance of dying if you're a man, and a 62% higher chance of dying if you're a woman. So this paper almost said to the world that if you're obese or overweight, you're most likely to die. Uh, even because that can be an independent prognostic indicator after any cancer treatment. Uh, similarly, so now we look at obesity incidence in India. So this was the Fit India movement launched last year. So nearly 10% of our population is obese, and that is just tip of the iceberg. And uh, if you look at the World Obesity Federation, even our children are now getting obese, and India is predicted to be number second after China going forward. So it's time we start thinking of obesity as a disease and just not as a symptom. Uh, and now going forward, as I said, this is one that now, now we're trying to show because initially the thought smoking was the biggest cause of cancer. But now I think in the Western world is, is coming to picture that is now the number one cause of cancer is being obesity. And why is that? Because obesity in itself 
can cause cancer. So this is a slide we use in uh, UK very often. So if you look at the thing, so women are very prone to develop breast cancer and womb cancer after postmenopause. The reason being the fat cells secrete estrogen and the estrogen makes the cell sort of multiply faster. In the men, obviously the insulin and growth factors and also inflammation. So it's a, it's a hypothesis of these three mechanisms. So women are more prone for, as I said, breast and womb cancer. And the men are more prone for like GI cancer and prostate cancer. And there's a whole other host of cancers associated with obesity. So that's where the game line is now changing because obesity is now causing cancer rather than being the olden style where sarcopenia was, was, was an effect of being a cancer. So just to give an insight of how our hospital is, so I work in HCG Hospital Bangalore. We, one of the, we are 26 centers across India. So this is a snapshot of just last year. And this is again a tip of the iceberg. We had 300 patients we had the data captured for. So if you look at 300 over the years, so females 175, males 125, nearly 50% of females are obese, which is, means BMI greater than 25 and overweight 22%, so more than BMI 23. So staggering 70% are overweight and these are cancer patients. And if you look at the males equally, obesity 45%, overweight 21, again greater than 60%. So this is the new spectrum of patients we are going to see going forward because we have obese patients who are now developing cancer and they have their own consequences because of that. Now, is obesity a problem as well for causing cancer? As I said earlier, this is again another study to just highlight to you. This is from America where they followed nearly 80,000 women over 12 years. And what they showed was if you're overweight for a longer duration during adulthood, your chances of getting cancer increases by 7 to 8 percent. So what I want to highlight in this particular thing is obesity is now possibly the number one cause of cancer. We should address it very carefully going forward as the problem is this uh, because what is happening is that we are now getting obese patients into our uh, cancer centers and other surgeries as well and what is the clinical impact of all this so just a brief uh, highlight so when you have a clinical impact first is assessment stuff so basically in any assessment of sarcopenic obesity uh, you try to measure the muscle mass the muscle strength and physical performance so the common tools which are used are ct or mri for muscle strength you tend to use hand grip strength in your clinic and physical performance is self-explanatory so this is the assessment of how you go about diagnosing someone with sarcopenic obesity so now this is a nice study which happened in spain so they looked at 3,000 patients with lung or gi cancer so look at the, the red, the blue dots are all with low BMI. The orange dots are patients with sarcopenic obesity. Now this paper was published around roughly three years ago. So you can see the dots are almost 10% of the population of sarcopenic obesity. And the bottom one, I think Dr. Shuka is going to explain very uh, briefly going forward in his talk. So the, all the red is lean mass, all the white is fat. So this was a patient of a lung cancer patient who had chemotherapy given. So look at the difference by the end of 10 months, all his muscle mass is gone, but the fat is maintained because they didn't foresee the problem that people need to be acting both on sarcopenia and obesity at the same time. So that so this is another paper which uh, possibly is one of the very good papers which highlights how significant sarcopenic obesity is in current climate. So this is a paper from America again where they looked at uh, patients who had pancreatic cancer and who went for surgery. So on the left, you have got patients who have BMI greater than 25, which is now we can classify as obesity. And, and on, the left, on the right side, you've got BMI less than 25. So they compared between sarcopenia and no sarcopenic patients. So if you see, if you're obese plus sarcopenia, your survival of life is reduced. So it's statistically significant. However, if your BMI is normal and you're sarcopenic, still they didn't see much difference. So this adds to the value that if you're sarcopenic obese, you're probably going to encounter more complications going forward. This is, uh, again, a review paper. Uh, which basically showed the impact of sarcopenic obesity and mortality and this is all on cancer cases we operate upon so if you look at the pancreas so the red button or the red graph is on normal patients and the blue is all sarcopenic obesity so if you look across the last uh, five years if you see there's only one paper in 2009 and again it's passed and again now it's picking up again about the focus on sarcopenic obesity so all the trials have significantly shown that if you're sarcopenic obese you're most likely to die compared to if you're normal. So again, a small paper at the bottom, which highlights uh, uh, this was again from a Spanish paper where 10% of patients who went for colon cancer over almost five years, 80 patients with sarcomanic obese, and out of seven out of 10 deaths that occurred within 30 days of surgery 
had sarcopenic obesity. So that possibly highlights the fact that this is not being recognized as we should be giving the due. So it's not only mortality, but also about surgical complications. So if you look at sarcopenic obesity, uh, so this is people who have undergone gastric cancer resection or pancreatic cancer resection. Again, you tend to have a higher complication rate if you're sarcopenic obese. And this is just not is to, to surgery. So even for oncologists, so you can see the chemotherapy toxicity. So if you're normal, you're most likely to have limited dose limited toxicity. But when people had chemotherapy in across the spectrum with skin cancer, lung cancer, GI cancer, if you're against sarcopenic obese, you're at a higher rate of getting complications. And that is very important because now we know that sarcopenic obesity is influencing clinical outcomes. And however good job you do as a surgeon, if you've not managed to identify that there's a problem, uh, you will end up with uh, problems going forward. So that begs the question, so what can we do for intervening in sarcopenic obesity? Now, this is a classic slide, uh, which Dr. Esther will also share with you. Uh, it, it's very simple. So if you have sarcopenia, how do you treat sarcopenia? How do you treat obesity? So this is where I want to highlight now, because it is always a conundrum when you get a cancer patient who is obese and cancer, because the focus shifts to management of cancer, not obesity. And what we're trying to highlight education is actually you can act on both. So example for sarcopenia, you know that you have muscle loss uh, with reduced energy expenditure. And exercise is a very good regimen to improve the muscle bulk. But that is complemented with nutrition, which is tailored towards addressing the sarcopenic element. At the same time, your nutrition and exercise also will help you with obesity and weight loss. So when this mixed together with a multidisciplinary approach with a good tailored team, you can approach to actually treat both sarcopenia and obesity. Uh, there are some drugs in literature which are being trialed, like the myostatin inhibitors, testosterone and hormone therapies. But this is slightly beyond the scope of this talk for today. Uh, so sarcopenia, as I said, everyone wants to have a nine pack uh, as seen on the right. Uh, and as you see, most of the people think that sarcopenia is only an older population. So if you go to America, there are lots of uh, uh, physiotherapy sessions which happens to reverse sarcopenia in older population. But that's not just true because now it's much more prevalent uh, than before. Uh, so if you see, uh, this is a, a couple of papers which shows. So if you have a a tailored program of exercises for sarcopenia. Uh, it has shown to increase in muscle protein synthesis, uh, reduction in myostatin expression, and increase in intramuscular IGF-1. So a bit of all uh, markers to show that your muscle bulk and function can be increased. Uh, the second point was a paper which they did a randomized controlled trial where they took patients who were breast cancer patients and put them into uh, exercise regimen and no exercise regimen. And what they showed at the end of the study so dedicated excess intervention in cancer patients led to effects on sarcopenic obesity, which means their skeletal mass index reduced and the BMI also decreased, also decreased. And the circulatory biomarkers were all significantly improved, showing that if you have exercise regimen in your uh, in your protocol, it actually has beneficial effects for this. Uh, so this is a dietic intervention. As I said, Dr. Esther is going to cover our experience going forward. But briefly, uh, diet plays a significant role uh, in reversing sarcopenia and treating obesity. So uh, any of my dietitian colleagues who have, logged, who have logged on, so please make sure you can combination of both. And it is not harmful. So patients actually do better uh, going forward. Uh, and this was a very nice study I just wanted to highlight, which I've, uh, which I've shown in my previous uh, presentation as well. So this was a study done in UK in Imperial where they had weight loss diet for adults uh, who BMI greater than 30. And what they did for these people is they put them on diet and eight weeks down the line, they did some blood markers and endoscopic biopsies of the colon. They particularly were looking for this called KI67, which uh, pathologist routinely uses uh, to measure cancer. So if there's cancer, they use this as a marker. So the people who are put on the study biopsies pre and post uh, this thing. And the one thing I want to highlight, so if you look at the KI67 marker with a red arrow, it was significantly reduced. So this was one of the first studies to demonstrate that potential cancer-relevant changes in colorectal tissue can happen following weight loss. And this is just diet achievement. So you can see even a bit of weight loss in the patient has significant effects. And it leads to this wonderful picture from, again, from uh, Cancer UK. Uh, so where they're, they're, this is one woman they've showed. So they've shown on the, uh, the left-hand side. So obesity is associated with, obviously, seven cancers from esophagus to the womb. And the right side, if you look, just look at the healthy weight BMI. So again, I said they are using the WHO scale. So if your BMI is healthy weight, 
So 190 for women uh, in 1,000 develop cancer. But as you keep putting on weight, you go overweight or obese, your chances are almost double up. So it's almost 41% increasing risk. So if you're in this, if we're doing interventions by uh, diet or by surgery to reduce their weight, we can actually push patients down this column, uh, going trying to push them to the healthy weight and reducing the risk. And this is what uh, the, the speakers ahead will talk to you about as well. Uh, so just to conclude uh, as to what I was talking about today. So obesity coexists with sarcopenia and should be recognized. I cannot uh, highlight enough that it's how important to recognize that if someone is an obese patient, they will have sarcopenia because there are now well-proven uh, molecular theories which support that. Now, assessment of SO should become a part of the norm. So in HCG where we function, so most of our patients go through an MDT discussion about whether they're sarcomenic obese or not. And any interventions in the form of diet, physio, yoga therapy will be implemented pre, post uh, treatment. Uh, and the main is multimodal intervention. So make sure you have teams in your uh, hospitals, which has a multimodal intervention, even the radiologist who can tell you whether the sarcopenic patients and the dietitians physio. So you can all come together to have actually do good outcomes for this patient. And the last bit, which is now again, very current in literature is cancer patients given with obesity can also benefit from this new terminology called oncobariatric surgery, which Dr. Asim is going to cover about. And this should be considered and tailored. So if you go back to the first case I showed and the lady with the BMI 46, we are offering her this uh, combined surgery going forward uh, because one of the theories is whether reducing the weight can we reduce their second cancer hit, uh, which we will see it going forward. And obviously none of the talks and webinars now can be uh, thanked without this particular slide. So stop coronavirus, be safe. Um, and thank you for uh, listening to us. And hopefully we'll take questions at the end. Okay, thank you very much. So shall I introduce the next speaker until Raghu comes in? Yes, Prabhu. Okay. So uh, I, I would delight like introducing the next speaker, Dr. Shiv Kumar, who is uh, one of the senior uh, radiology consultants in uh, HCG and is also the head of the department. Uh, he's very much involved in uh, onco radiology for the last 10 years in HCG and has got a very keen interest in research and also sarcopenia. Uh, so Shiv Kumar, I don't have your whole CV in front of me, but I think uh the, the the idea that you want to that should be fine the one of the experts in this field so i'm glad you can highlight to people about uh, how do you assist sarcopenia in uh, cancer patients uh, the forum is to you uh, shivkumar okay thank you uh thank you dr prabhu i think uh, uh most of the things has already been discussed uh, in terms of clinical and thanks to dr prabhu and also nestle for having me uh, uh this is something uh, not much discussed, uh, uh, you know, if you ask me, uh, in all these years, I think once Dr. Raghu has, uh, Dr. Prabhu has uh, stepped into HCG, we started talking about all this and with Esther Channing, uh, these things have been discussed. And even for us radiologists, it is uh, not routinely asked whether somebody has got uh, sarcopenia and uh, do, we, uh, do we know how to diagnose all this. Uh, we never thought of these things. I mean, uh, now the interest has uh, grown and after having the discussions with the team and now we, I started realizing, you know, there's a lot of changes that happens. Though we know that patient lose weight, the scan show uh, patients are emaciated, the fat goes off or even the muscle bulk comes down. Uh, we never used to, you know, quantify or tell the clinician that, uh, you know, this is what is happening unless because if, they, if there is no intervention available, obviously, uh, people will not take it very uh, seriously, especially the oncologists will not be too keen on looking at that aspect of, uh, you know, body changes. So this has been discussed and uh, uh, coming to the definition, I'll, I'll just start off with uh, the definitions that this has been discussed by Dr. Uh, Prabhu and uh, there's something called a sarcopenic obesity, uh, not just sarcopenia where there is increase in fat mass uh, apart from, uh, you know, uh, correlating with the uh, muscle fibers also. So most of the time, sarcopenia is considered primary and secondary when there is coexisting other multifactorial disease or uh, other things. 
So if you look at the incidence, you know, 20% of the healthy people under these 70 years of age will have sarcopenia and nearly or, or, the, or 50 years of uh, population over the age of 80 will develop sarcopenia. And this is the uh, epidemiological survey, what has been given, the Chinese have done it, the Japanese have done it. And even in Asian population, the median prevalence is as high as 52.7%. Uh, and as I said, the secondary causes are multifactorial. It, it, it can include multi-system disease as well. So in oncology, this sarcopenia is quite often seen with, seen with GI cancers because they will have some kind of eating disorder and coupled with vomiting and other metabolic, uh, uh, other metabolic uh, syndromes, they lead to malnutrition and the incidence of sarcopenia is pretty high with uh, uh, GI cancers. And in that, uh, the colorectal cancers, though the, the incidence is very high, the colorectal, the esophageal and the stomach cancer patients will have will definitely have sarcopenia uh, at the time of diagnosis and they carry a very bad post operative complications and not just with surgery even the outcomes with uh, you know any kind of therapy especially the chemotherapy they generally don't do well so this particular thing has been uh, discussed by dr prabhu you know there is sarcopenia associated with obesity which can be multifactorial. There's something called as uh, sarcoosteopenia also, where there is osteopor osteoporosis associated with sarcopenia and osteosarcopenic obesity, where it's a combination of osteoporosis, sarcopenia, and obesity. Uh, these terminologies, uh, the reason why I'm bringing up is all these can be picked up on imaging. Uh, so we'll look at, there are many imaging modalities that has been um, uh, done to diagnose uh, these kind of uh, changes. And many non-invasive techniques, uh, diagnostic uh, techniques have been used, including, uh, uh, you know, SARS uh, scale, anthropometry, strength testing, uh, and also by electrical impedance analysis and other uh, serum markers. Uh, when it comes to imaging diagnostic uh, techniques, uh, the most extensively utilized technique is the uh, DEXA or the whole body dual X-ray absorptiometry technique. Next is ultrasound can also be used. MRI can be used and CT can also be used. I'll just touch upon each technique a little bit and what are the advantages and disadvantages. And uh, you know, any imaging technique, if we are using it should be readily available. It should be, you know, some kind of not too expensive, but uh, you, you you should be able to get the data if, if the uh, scan is done for something else and if you can get the data from that that is something will be very benefited so that you can avoid doing many more investigations so dexa is something which has been extensively uh, utilized uh, when it comes to even in indian scenario not many people ask for dexa uh, you know uh, people are more interested in just looking at osteoporosis is there more, especially the endocrinologist or the orthopedic surgeons they look at you know what is the quality of the bone is, is the patient going for uh, you know fracture osteoporotic fracture or not or what is how do you quantify but as such dexa can also be utilized to look at the muscle mass uh, not just in the trunkal regions but also the appendicular regions and a lot of softwares are available with dexa but this is a very uh, underutilized and the other reason for this is, you know, uh, the commercial uh, viability of this techniques. Though even though we have uh, DEXA, the availability of whole body DEXA is also makes a lot of difference. You need to upgrade these kind of softwares also. And what we do in DEXA is two X-ray at different energy levels have been shot and the whole body scan is taken. So what Parameters does this give? It gives the lean mass, the fat mass, the bone mineral content. So these parameters will be given by the DEXA per se. But then it cannot differentiate between the visceral fat and the subcutaneous fat. That is one drawback. We'll come to that. And with this, we can also uh, get this appendicular lean mass, that is the ALMI index, which is the uh, uh, lean mass of the uh, limbs divided by the height. So the normograms have been given by the EWGSOP 
uh, where the diagnostic cutoff values have been give, given. That is the advantage of DEXA. You know the normal uh, cutoff values for depending on the different ethnic uh, uh, regions. This is something which is actually missing with a cross-sectional imaging, mainly the CTR, MRR, even ultrasound uh, for that matter. So, but then it has got its own disadvantages. We'll come to that. And this is the ultrasound image. Uh, ultrasound can also be utilized for this assessing the muscle bulkiness of the mass. So if you look at this particular uh, image, this is a high, resolu uh, high resolution ultrasound. You can actually contour the whole muscle through and through in length. Look at the thickness of the muscle fibers and look at the quality of the muscle per se. Uh, when we uh, do a lot of scans, uh, we do say that, you know, if some muscle is going into atrophy, we call this fatty atrophy because the fat gets seeped into the muscle fibers and the quality of the muscle will go down. We can actually look at, if we look at the echogenicity, what we call of this particular muscle and this particular muscle, this is definitely atrophic and you can see a lot of uh, bright lines. These are all fat areas. So there is fat depositions. This, this particular patient, though there is significant loss of the uh, muscle, there's also infiltration of the fat. So in, in the end, the patient may not be uh, showing too much of weight loss, but then there is definitely sarcopenic obesity because the fat component has increased. So this kind of quantification can be done, but the only major problem with ultrasound is that reproducibility because uh, you know, this has to be done uh, by a person. You know, if you try to put a lot of pressure on the muscle, it gets compressed. So the repro reproducibility is very difficult. And the other problem is the patient body hab habitus. If it is an obese patient, if the subcutaneous fat is very thick, obviously you won't be able to see the deeper muscles prob uh, in, in, in good length. Uh, or particularly if you're looking at one area that may be become very difficult. And then MRI has come in a big way. Of course, MRI, I would say it is superior to CT, but the only problem with MRI is that it's an expensive tool. And uh, we know that MRI can give a lot of things, not just the subcutaneous fat, intramuscular uh, fatty areas, fibrotic areas, the edema part, if you look at this particular image, we call this as T2 axial, which is uh, axial image, that's the cross-sectional image, T2-weighted image, and the complete fat and the bone component has removed, and we can give the complete cross-sectional area of the muscle per se. And this uh, particular color-coded image shows this fluid because of the edema. This is like fibrosis or the thickening of the facial planes and also uh, other inflammatory process. All this information can be given uh, with MRI. There are numerous uh, you know, uh, sequences that can be added upon if someone is really interested in building up, but then this all adds to cost. And how frequently can we utilize this modality is something which we have to think of. And it can also show myosteototus, that is the fatty uh, infiltration of the muscle is what I said, and also the fibrotic strands. And next, CT. CT is something which has become a standard diagnostic tool for most of the cancer surge treatments, not just cancer treatments. You take any disease for that matter, I think CT has become very standard. So whether it's cancer, major surgery, or vascular disease, CT has become very standard. So it is routinely done on most of the patients uh, for any uh, surgical intervention before they uh, take, take up. It can accurately differentiate between the fat muscle tissue, and it can give the specific attenuation of the Hounsfield unit uh, for each of the tissue when we measure. And a detailed anatomical information is also possible with CT for any, uh, when we use this for a diagnostics tool. Uh, it, it, it gives uh, different diagnostic criteria like skeletal muscle index, which is the calculated area of the total skeletal uh, muscle. Uh, which is generally done at the lumbar, third lumbar vertebra divided by the height of the individual. So why do we select this third lumbar? Generally what happens is uh, at third or fourth lumbar vertebra, most of the solid organs in the upper abdomen would have ended. What you can just, uh, you can see is, uh, you know, the paraspinal muscles, the psoas muscles, the abdominal valve muscles, lean muscles, uh, you get good, 
subcutaneous fat and also visceral fat so visceral fat is something which we are very keen the intra abdominal fat which increases with obesity or the subcutaneous fat so you can analyze the muscle as well as the subcutaneous fat i'll show uh, uh, the cases what we have done so many authors have put a cut off value for uh, ct uh, different authors have come up so this is the problem with ct that you know norm, uh, normal cut off values for uh, uh, skeletal muscle index has which has been given some people say 52 or some people say 53 but the population based or ethnic based is something which we need so this is where we are uh, lacking uh, when it comes to ct so if you look at this complete table uh, the advantage the pros and cons of different diagnostic studies have come uh, have been shown and where the dexa stands is that you know it lacks portability and it's a two dimensional it's not a three dimensional whereas cross sectional images are three dimensional you can accurately know the uh, 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 fat component or the muscle component uh, in the, in this in the images and uh, dexa cannot differentiate as i said between the subcutaneous and the visceral fat so that is another drawback and it does not include the trunk muscles also again that's a drawback the ct is very good but again it comes with radiation and also cost you i think we should make use of ct if the ct data is available for some other diagnostic tool you can pull the same images and start doing assessment mri is not routinely available you know uh, but uh, and also expensive you can't be doing uh, mri for just to diagnose di sarcopenia ultrasound i have mentioned some of the disadvantages of ultrasound uh, it, when it comes to uh, looking at the skeletal muscle index uh, on ct or mri if you if you take up the any of these uh, imaging techniques we can not just uh, we, we need not just scan at one level we can also scan at multiple levels and see what is the thickness of the muscle if you are looking at serial assessment of the, of a of an individual uh, we can actually do at the you know neck level or the shoulder levels look at the thickness of the muscles uh, before and after treatment all that is definitely possible but we need our programs for all this so with this i'll just uh, take you to the ct analysis what i have done so this was when it comes to imaging uh, radiology not many people are presenting on this data because we know that we can do this but we don't know what are the clinical implications and if any particular treatment or a clinician who is involved who is really interested in looking at these kind of changes uh, this is one cancer imaging society uh, this uk based which they uh, published uh, uh, proceedings in 2017 where they looked at the low attenuation values or these hansfield values of the uh, muscle on the ct scans so with this uh, i will just show a couple of cases uh, particularly which i did i did a lot of research to get the software to do this there are commercially available softwares now coming up with many third party vendors which are quite expensive but one particular uh, thing is uh, core slicer which is an research tool freely available this is not commercial this is a research tool that has been given freely of uh, on net which we can make use of any abdominal ct uh, minimum of 3 mm sections is ideal you take up that scan you load this on this the first step is to load the axial sections and then when you go to step 2 you take this sagittal image of the same a uh, whole abdomen scan and select the vertebral level is that l l3 or l4 l3 is what is recommended many a times it depends on the uh, build of the patient if you think that the liver is overhanging probably you can move it down uh, to include the good uh, visceral fat and at that level once you select you then take this particular level and you have this color coding brush available you just have to sit and paint these areas you take the you know surface area of this uh, psoas muscle paraspinal muscles abdominal wall muscles uh, the subcutaneous fat and the visceral fat so this is how i did this this is a particular patient uh, a patient of ca breast this is at the time of diagnosis i took the uh, whole body ct scan image of this particular patient and 
I contour the muscles. This is the psoas muscle. It not just looks at the thickness, but the surface area, the left and the right psoas muscle, the paraspinal and the abdominal wall muscles, the subcutaneous fat, all are color coded and even the visceral fat. It, it will clearly take the uh, fat in, uh, in general. Fat on CT, we call this as attenuation values or the Hounsfield values, which are on the negative side of the scale. So it will easily pick up and it starts giving these values of the surface area. This immediately will give the values of the or the size of that particular organ, but it can also, this is, this is how it takes. This is the right and left psoas muscle. This is the visceral fat, this is subcutaneous fat and the abdominal wall uh, lean, mu lean muscle. So when, when you take up the only the contoured image, the bone component or the solid organs, everything has been removed. This is what we are going to assess at that one particular level. So with that, I did this study for a breast cancer patient. Uh, this is at the time of diagnosis and after uh, chemotherapy nearly after six months after the therapy. So these are the values that are given. If you look at the psoas muscle, the right and left, the abdominal wall muscle area, uh, uh, and the subcutaneous fat and the visceral fat, it not just gives the area, but also the Hounsfield values. This is the quantification. The HE values, more the less, it, it, it means that more fat is getting accumulated. If you look at this top row is at the time of diagnosis, this is after therapy. If you look at this patient, you, the abdominal wall per se, you see this values have dropped down. So the skeletal muscle volume is coming down. Even the uh, psoas muscle hits you where the fat is getting uh, accumulated within the psoas muscle and the subcutaneous fat has gone up. The visceral fat has gone up. If you look at the area, the visceral fat has gone up. So basically, even though this patient is not having uh, weight loss, but the uh, she's kind of developing sarcopenic obesity. So these are the patients with, if proper intervention is done and nutrition is given, probably their outcomes are definitely better. We need to do a lot of studies on these kind of patients uh, on a regular basis. Out of curiosity, I took one more patient. Not this is from lymphoma. There's a huge abdominal lymph nodal mass at the same level. I did the same contour and then I analyzed this study as well. So this is at a time gap of say about three to four months. And again, in this patient also, the abdominal, abdominal uh, uh, muscle area has come down, but uh, you know, the subcutaneous fat area has also come down. This patient is losing weight and also, the, though the psoas muscle did not show much of the difference, but this patient is becoming, uh, you know, uh, uh, sarcopenic as well at the same time, losing as abdominal fat because no intervention in terms of nutritional uh, help has been given. She has been receiving chemotherapy, and that's what this is. So it's it's an exciting exciting tool. We can just do it at the click of a button uh, if we know the proper technique, and you don't have to be dependent on. Uh, standalone equipment like a DEXA where you have to send the patient and the results are but only problem with uh, CT is that we don't have normograms for population based or the ethnic based that we have to uh, do. So with that I conclude uh, with few slides. DEXA has a repro uh, is very reproducible and CT MRI have become sort of gold standard. Ultrasound can also be used for this kind of analysis. So thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for, uh, for the, for the th thoughts uh, shared, especially on uh, sarcoostopenia and the entire diagnosis part on, uh, on how to uh, diagnose uh, in terms of the tools that are used. Thank you so much. Uh, for the, the next uh, uh, speaker for, uh, for this uh, uh, event, uh, we have uh, Dr. Asim Shabir. Hi, sir. Good evening. Thank you so much for uh, joining for this program. Um, can I request you to have your video on, sir? Hi, sir. Good evening.
Yeah. Yeah. So just to hi. Good evening. Yeah. Thank you. Very yeah. Uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Asim Shabir, uh, uh, he is a consultant, upper GI cancer and bariatric surgeon from NUH Singapore, and uh, he he is a past president of uh, Obesity and Metabolic Surgery Society of Singapore. And uh, uh, to give some thoughts about his academics, uh, he finished his uh, master's in medicine from NUH Singapore, his MRCS and FRCS from Royal College of Surgeons uh, Edinburgh, and he has quite a set of publications to his credit. Uh, close to five of them uh, we really thank you so much sir uh, uh, really appreciate uh, for that you've taken time for this uh, talk and to share uh, your uh, academics with all thank you so much sir uh, the the field is yours thank you very much um, and a very good evening to all of you uh, thank you first of all to all the participants i can see uh, the great interest that you all have uh, 126 29 participants is the highest we have hit today uh, which is a great number. I mean, considering it's a Friday night, uh, you have stayed away from the Corona hit crowds and uh, come and join us. So uh, I hope uh, we make it worthwhile for you. And I will start my presentation now. Uh, start. Let's go start. All right. So um, that's that's where we are. I I'm, I'm glad that Prabhu team and Nestle. Uh, requested me to speak on the topic. This is something that's close to my heart. Um, so, Bravo and um, Nisla guys asked me to speak on onco bariatric surgery, implementing it in clinical practice. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed Prabhu's talk and the subsequent talk, uh, and I personally learned a lot. Uh, we know that overweight and obesity would be the second leading cause of cancer soon in the world, if it is not, at least in the UK it is. And keep, keeping these uh, weight and related issues off will make a difference. So let's let's look into uh, this clinical practice and see what was got for us as well. Um, I will concentrate on two main cancers today. Uh, I will concentrate one on a cancer, which is endometrial cancer. And I would concentrate on the other, which is basically a metabolic uh, so-called disease. Uh, and in my part of Asia, it is prevalent along with uh, gastric cancer. So we will talk about gastric cancer, oncology, and these are the two prime drivers uh, in association with obesity. I would ask critical questions along the way, and we'll try and answer these questions. Does lifestyle modification related weight loss result in change in the risk of endometrial cancer. So let's try and address endometrial cancer and see what weight loss has. And then we can decide whether bariatric surgery as a part of an oncology surgery before, after, when uh, would make a difference. So here we go. Uh, does weight loss in the very first place make a difference? So here is a Cochrane uh, update. Uh, and if you look at lifestyle interventions, um, they do not impact survival in patients with endometrial cancer. Here again, look at the forest plot, the diamond crosses the line. So there is no evidence that either lifestyle interventions alone or coupled with behavior interventions affect cancer specific or overall survival, even recurrence free survival or reduce the number of cardiovascular metabolic events in patients with endometrial cancer. So, yes, you can ask people to lose weight, but I think it's the quantum of the weight that these patients have to lose uh, that they're not able to, one, uh, achieve and to maintain, uh, which makes the difference. So then if medical therapy doesn't do that, then do surgeons and surgical interventions actually do it. So let's go and look at the evidence. And this is basically a large cohort. And you can see this is the incidence of cancer development uh, by surgical and non-surgical uh, groups. Uh, and you can see for all types of cancers, which are the, the authors have divided it into um, obesity-related and non-related cancers. Uh, and you can see here non-surgical intervention, uh, the risk of developing uh, cancer 1.45%, whereas with the surgical group, it's much lower, 1.31. If you look at the sheer number of events, uh, 4,702, 4, 913. And also for non-obesity-related cancer, weight loss still impacts uh, the occurrence of cancer. 
Now, if you look at how does bariatric surgery chip in here, you can see that all procedures make a difference. But what is very striking in this graph is when you consider the band has become relatively obsolete in the time we are living in. So we are left with a bypass and a sleeve gastrectomy. If you compare bypass to sleeve gastrectomy for non-obesity related cancers, there is something that the bypass and the sleeve is doing, which is even decreasing the incidence of this cancer occurring after bariatric surgery. And you can see even obesity related cancers, uh, uh, these operations are making a difference as a, as a group, but more so impact created by a gastric bypass. Now let's look at specifically female specific cancers. This is the SOS uh, data, the Swedish Obesity Surgery Group data, uh, where it's a longitudinal database where they are control patients, 1,447 to be exact, matched against patients who went through bariatric surgery, 1,200 and uh, 1,420 patients. And you can see that out at 20, Two years of follow-up time, the surgery group who has lost weight, which is here on the small left graph shown in the red light, as compared to the other group, has a lower prevalence or incidence of cancer. Now, this is a meta-analysis, uh, hot off the press, uh, and it included 188 articles, of which seven were taken into this. Uh, and accounting for 150,000 patients in bariatric surgery arm and a very large arm in the cohorts of control patients. If you look at female-specific cancer, weight loss surgery, so here in favor of bariatric surgery, in favor, not in favor of bariatric surgery. So breast cancer reduction following bariatric surgery is 49%. Ovarian cancer. 53%, endometrial cancer, 67%. So a huge number, more than half of your patients would have a decrease in the number of cancer incidences. So does oncology surgery followed or concomitant with bariatric surgery prevent cancer recurrence? So patient has got a cancer, you operate, which is the oncobariatric concept that we are putting forward, does it really decrease the recurrence rate of these cancers? We So we know it is going to prevent, as we have learned just now in the slides. The second question is, can you prevent recurrence? So this is an interesting paper on endometrial cancer, just recently published again, uh, I think September last year, one year old publication, where a 54 years old lady underwent a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass and a surgery for her endometrial cancer. BMI 48.6, stage 1A, grade 1 endometrial cancer. 12 months out, she had lost 30.7% of her body weight. There has been no recurrence and there has been remission of diabetes. The kind of data here we're specifically looking at is recurrence and bariatric surgery. And I'm, I, I, I must acknowledge that there is paucity of literature which speaks about this. So I went dug and further dug into it and I only was able to find this glorious paper from breast cancer. Um, what is interesting is that this is a really long longitudinal follow-up. Look at the follow-up, 11.7 years, ranging from 3 to 20.6 years median follow-up in these patients. I apologize for the small slide. I didn't want to miss any of the data. But what you can see is that among the patients, breast cancer patients that have been followed up overall N13 for a very long period of time, and who underwent bariatric surgery in these patients, you can see there is only one case of recurrence versus 12 who did not recur, 92.3% non-recurrence. So bariatric surgery does even impact patients who actually have uh, been treated for cancer and prevents recurrence.
So who are these patients who me and you would choose? Generally, these are patients who have early stage cancers in whom chronic diseases, cancer will result in mortality. So there's no point taking uh, somebody with a stage 4A, 4B cancer and doing an oncometabolic surgery because it may, it's, it's unlikely to going to have an impact on survival, whether that is disease-free survival or overall survival, but definitely on, on long-term survival, it will make a difference. I've personally operated on a bunch of these endometrial cancer patients. However, my data isn't uh, mature yet and I wouldn't be able to present it, uh, but I would do uh, the next, uh, uh, I, I will share some examples from my next presentation. So then the other next thing that we come up to is oncometabolic or surgery, another name. The oncometabolic is basically a patient who is diagnosed with both gastric cancer, which is quite prevalent in my part of the world, and type 2 diabetes, and they undergo a single operation with the purpose of treating both diseases. So you're going to cure gastric cancer, and you're going to treat the uh, morbid obesity at the same time. So generally, what's happened across the globe, and especially in Korea, Japan, China, these countries where the prevalence of gastric cancer is very, very high, they have been able to achieve an over 90% survival for their patients with early gastric cancer beyond five years, which means these people will then almost behave like normal human beings exposed to chronic uh, illnesses and other risks. So long-term care in these patients uh, includes management of these and improvement of quality of life. Uh, the other striking thing between gastric cancer surgery and bariatric surgery is procedures are more or less similar. Uh, and you can, apart from oncology benefit, you can get glycemic benefits in these patients. So why should we be doing it? We should be doing it because there is evidence that diabetes in its own is a risk factor for mortality in patients with gastric cancer whether that's due to complications, whether that's due to long-term issues that arise uh, in these patients, uh, it is basically a risk factor. Cure of diabetes after metabolic surgery is correlated with the high five-year survival rate. So that's why we should be doing it. How does it aim to, what does it aim to achieve? It basically is to treat two diseases in one, improve quality of life and hopefully uh, confer a better survival in these patients once again. <clears throat> these are some of the procedures that are currently endorsed <clears throat> by the world organizations uh, as bariatric procedures. So a switch, a uh, simple bypass, uh, one anastomosis bypass, a biliopancreatic diversion with or without duodenal switch. <clears throat> now, these are gastric cancer procedures. <clears throat> What you can see here is after a distal gastrectomy, if you do a Billroth one, it resembles to something like a sleeve gastrectomy, except that the pouch is really big. The Billroth two and the Rue NY bypasses either after a distal gastrectomy or a total gastrectomy are more or less similar to a Rue NY bypass or a one anastomosis bypass, depending upon how they are done. And in these, one anastomosis bypass or UNY bypass, one of the critical things and things of more importance is the fact that the duodenal segment and with a segment of proximal jejunum is bypassed, which is well noted for its amelioration of diabetes. So there have been multiple studies on non-obese gastric cancer populations <clears throat> with, with the, the BMIs ranging from the 20s to the mid 30s uh, and confirm the effect of metabolic effect of these uh, newer forms of operative procedures in managing uh, diabetes. <clears throat> so there are some striking differences, however, among the patients that me and you would choose. Candidates for oncometabolic surgery would be generally older. They will be more frail and they will have lower BMIs. This confers a higher risk of an invasive procedure in general, and age also has an implication in type 2 diabetes. 
So gastric patients with BMI in the range of normal or overweight may benefit from the same post-operative nutritional approach. On the contrary, they may actually require you to increase their weight. And I will share example of these cases as I go along the way towards the end of my thing. So we have an obese, as Prabhu mentioned, we have an obese population with diabetes with cancer, and we have people who are diabetes, who may not be morbidly obese, but may be overweight, and then will lose 10%, become undernourished, and you might have to improve their weights on the other hand. So there's a bit of a fight here. <clears throat> so mechanism resulting in diabetes, we all know either there is deficiency of the beta cells, which means that there is lack in the production of insulin, <coughs> decreased insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance, uh, and then patients who have poor uh, out, uh, outcomes are those who have long history or long duration of diabetes because their beta cells have burnt out and they have low pancreatic reserves. <clears throat> this was a great trial by Michael Yin and his colleagues published in Lancet. Uh, and he was able to show that if inner in normal individuals who are morbidly obese, lifestyle modification could result in normalization of glycemia if they were able to lose above 15 kilograms of weight. All right. This lower extreme graph here, you can see. Uh, from the graph at even year to 70% of the patients who had maintained above 15 kg weight loss were euglycemic in this great interventional trial with Cambridge diet done by the Professor Mike Lean and his team. <clears throat> so um, what are we relying here then if we're going to do on co metabolic on cobariatric surgery, we are going to rely on the duodenal bypass to basically give us the same effect in these patients. And if you look at a meta regression analysis uh, that has been published, it is more likely that patients would benefit from a B2 anastomosis as compared to a Billroth 1. A Billroth 1 is where we will correct, connect the distal stomach directly to the duodenum and the bell rock two is one where we will have bypassed the first duodenal segment, bypassed the first jejunum segment, bypassed the first jejunum and then connected to the remnant pouch. So the duodenum and the first proximal few centimeters of jejunum do not take part in sensing of nutrients that pass through them. Since nutrients are not passing, there is no sensing and that seems to ameliorate diabetes. In a very well-designed experiment, uh, one of the famous researchers uh, in the field of bariatric surgery showed that if you feed these patients back into the gastric pouch, the diabetes resurges. And if you stop feeding into the pouch, uh, it basically, into the, sorry, into the bypass limb, if you stop feeding into the bypass limb, uh, they will actually improve their diabetes once again. <clears throat> So that's why people have come up uh, with this new concept. In a conventional Roux and Y total gastrectomy, the biliopancreatic limb, which means the duodenum and the jejunum that is bypassed and does not take part in food, is about 30 to 40 centimeters. Whereas the limb that connects between the food pipe, which is the esophagus, and then connects to the remaining uh, duodenum uh, is approximately uh, let me just go back and let me just try and get you to the figures. Sorry. I should have just put a diagram there. All right. So this is a Roux and Y. This is esophagus. You can see this is the elementary limb and this is the biliopancreatic limb. Normally, this is 30, 40, and this is uh, otherwise as we see. But now what people are doing in the modern era is to increase the length of these in these patients. Just give me a minute. Sorry. Okay. And <clears throat> they have increased the biliopancreatic limb to 150 centimeters and keep the, the elementary limb in at 30 to 40 centimeters. Uh, and why? Because elementary limb generally is a part and parcel of the digestive process. So 
What now the bariatric community believes is that manipulating the length of the biliopancreatic limb will make more sense and bypassing more ju uh, jejunum. And this has been shown in a study of what, 226 patients where B2 uh, uh, anastomosis or recreation resulted in a better outcome in these patients. <clears throat> the remission rates uh, of B2 anastomosis, Bill Roth's two, where there is a bypass segment of duodenum and jejunum and a direct communication to the stomach is about 1% to 82%. And that means patients are euglycemic without the need for medications. On the other hand, if you remove even the remaining part of stomach in these patients, you can get a remission from anywhere between 27.3 to 90%. <clears throat> what is important to know is that over 50% of patients in both groups from these studies will actually develop or have a benefit from the surgical interventions that me and you would do. <clears throat> um, if you look at this great study, uh, again from Hong Kong, you see that improved in about 55% of their patients at two years and at five years follow-up, about half of the patient population actually showed great improvement in diabetes. And what were the parameters that basically uh, uh, signified an improvement in diabetes? There were BMI and HbA1c levels, which means uh, a surrogate marker of the fact that they had basically reserve in beta cells. All types of gastric cancers can be effective in short and long-term diabetes control in non-obese patients. So the literature out there for non-obese is very limited. There is low BMI, but not non-obese, uh, which I call 27.5 and below. <clears throat> Here is the outcome of that study. This is Bill Roth 1 anastomosis. This is Bill Roth 2. This is Ruan Y with total gastrectomy. Look at Ruan Y with total gastrectomy. The dark blue column <clears throat> is complete remission. That is one quarter of your patients would be complete remission. And if you add up all the others here, you include it's approximately two thirds of your patients, even in low BMI patients would actually have an improvement in their diabetes status just by manipulating the bowel loops. Here in Bill Roth 2, again, about two thirds of the patients will benefit, but in Bill Roth 1, only half a, uh, percent of population would benefit at the end of five years. So unless long limb bypasses is considered in gastric surgery, the long-term glycemic control is not expected to be different between the reconstruction methods. So using a longer limb, that means making the biliopancreatic limb longer would result in a better outcome for your patients for diabetes. Well, if you make the biliopancreatic limb longer, will it have nutritional consequences? Certainly it would. If you convert from a Bilrot 2 to a total gastrachne, certainly there will be vitamin B12 deficiencies, uh, but not in excess. And patients like the bariatric patients would need supplementation over time. What is interesting in this patient in this paper is remission rates of type 2 diabetes. Uh, if you compare these with historical controls in the long limb, 77.8% remission compared to 50% remission, T1, N0 stage, BMI over 32.5 or 27.5. So the, as the BMI goes up, remission rates are actually better. Okay, now let's just go on to my practice. I have a couple of cases that I would like to discuss, and this is case number one. <clears throat> this is one of my patients who is basically a gastric cancer patient in the age of about, I think, 50 something years of age. Uh, came in, uh, diagnosed with gastric cancer, known to have diabetes on two drugs for diabetes. One is metformin and the other is glipizide, 80 milligrams twice daily. Uh, 51 kg, BMI being 21.4. Post-operatively, uh, the tumor came back. We thought it was a T2 and 1 tumor. But it came back to be a T3, which is subserosal N2, uh, because the, there were three lymph nodes involved. 
we dissect our lymph nodes very uh, religiously. Uh, but you can see that despite, despite a longer follow-up, the patient's metformin is still maintained. The glycoside dose has come down to 80 milligrams once daily. And this patient who Prabhu would typically result, uh, would have said that is sarcopenic and may not be obese, but has actually gained weight. <clears throat> and now comes into the healthy BMI range uh, in what in Asian BMI healthy range that is concerned. Now look at this patient. When we started off somewhere in about mid-2018, starting do doing these procedures, <clears throat> the HbA1c of this patient was 7.4. Now, after going surgery, you can see HbA1c is dipped. And you can see that it dipped, especially within the first six months after surgery, which is where you expect that 10% weight loss to come and patients not eating very well. And the glycemic control slided. As the patient's uh, time uh, chemotherapy finished, the patient started eating better, you see that the glycemia rose. And at 6.4, we intervened, started metformin back, and then started maintaining the patient on glycoside. And you can see even despite a weight gain in this patient, the HbA1c has come down to 5.9. This patient had 10 years of diabetes. So 10 years of diabetes, low BMI weight, uh, just manipulating the biliopancreatic limb to make it 75 centimeters instead of the conventional 30 centimeters or 40 centimeters we have been able to achieve a euglyc nearly euglycemic patient. Whether with or without medication, it doesn't matter. If, can you imagine if the patient, despite being 21 BMI, continued on this trend, the patient by the age of 70 would have developed all the complications of diabetes that me and you could think of. Case study two. <clears throat> Gastric cancer patient with type 2 diabetes. Uh, T1B, uh, N0, uh, lymph nodes. Sorry, I don't know where the three came from, but this is N, uh, N0. Metformin, 850 milligrams after surgery. And these are all after 18 months of surgery. Uh, 50, uh, 500 milligrams TDS. So decreased by 250 uh, milligrams uh, every time. Glycoside basically now taken off weight from a BMI of 28.4 gone down to 24.1 BMI. So there is weight loss as compared to the other case where there was a weight gain here. And with a <clears throat> reconstruction here again, which is ruin Y, you can see that initially the patients, once he was diagnosed with diabetes, the glycemia came up here. We intervened with surgery and as time passed by, the patient's glycemia has remained stable. Despite weight loss, this patient has not responded as well to surgery because, again, we bypassed a shorter limb length here. Instead of the conventional 40 centimeters, we have bypassed only about, uh, I think, in this one was 75 centimeters in this patient. Secondly, this patient is still going through chemotherapy and has just finished. So <clears throat> over time, we hope to see an improvement in this patient. With that, uh, I come to the end of my talk. So oncometabolic surgery is here to stay. Uh, it will be tailored largely to the needs of our patient. Um, we will need to tailor the biliopancreatic limbs of these patients, better manage their nutrition, there's a paucity of data, and I'm sure that as we go along, especially the Western world, as they go along, we will have more data uh, as they get interested in this field. And over the years, we will build more evidence. And you can be part of that evidence. Uh, with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Asim, uh, for this wonderful uh, data-based uh, talk on uh, endometrial cancer, gastric cancer, and oncometabolic surgery as well. Uh, we have uh, one more uh, uh, interesting talk. Uh, this introduce uh, Dr. Esther Satyaraj. Uh, 
she is the head clinical uh, head of uh, clinical nutrition and dietetics at the HCG Hospitals Bangalore. Uh, she is a PhD in nutrition from NIN Hyderabad. She is a registered dietitian certified by the IDA. Close to 15 years of clinical experience with a lot of experience and publishing uh, quite a number of papers in national and international journals. Uh, welcome, Dr. Esther, to this program. Thank you so much for accepting our uh, our invite for this. Uh, you can you can start your uh, talks, ma'am. Okay, so uh, you know when you are the last speaker, you have a greater challenge of uh, not letting the people leave the room. Uh, so just to encourage all of you, uh, we tried something uh, new at HCG at uh, at our center, and we got some encouraging results, which is what I'll be sharing with all of you. So uh, just stay put, stay patient with me for the next 10, 15 minutes, and uh, I'm sure you will not be disappointed. So uh, thank you, Dr. Prabhu. Thanks, Nestle, for organizing this. Uh, I'm going to be discussing about dietetic and multimodal intervention in sarcopenic obese cancer patients. And I will be sharing some of the experiences that we have had. OK, so as uh, we are all aware that many patients with cancer experience poor nutrition status, which negatively impacts the clinical outcomes. Poor nutrition status is primarily manifested as uh, severe muscle mass depletion, which can coexist with obesity, as uh, covered by my previous speakers. Sarcopenia and cachexia prevalence in cancer is very high, and therefore anthropometric analysis might not be adequate to recognize sarcopenia. So I will be elaborating on that uh, in the coming slides. So why is, it, uh, why is it important to diagnose sarcopenia? Because evidence now says that pre-treatment sarcopenia predicts chemotherapy toxicity, reduced responses, increased disability, poor tumor, anti-tumor response, and survival. Therefore, reversing low muscle mass has a potential to improve cancer therapy outcomes, morbidities, and ultimately mortality. So what are the gaps that we as nutritionists face? Now, whenever the, uh, the low muscle mass is studied in cancer, it is always studied uh, in the presence of refractory cachexia. And uh, as we know, refractory cachexia is irreversible and non-responsive to nutrition intervention. So there is a lot of doubt uh, on, uh, with regard to you know, the impact of nutrition interventions to countermeasure um, the depletion of muscle mass. What are the challenges that we face as nutritionists? We, we have very limited use of body composition tools. Uh, many centers in India do not have uh, body composition analyzers. Uh, different criteria for uh, low muscle mass, as highlighted by Dr. Shivkumar, uh, we don't have a, a clear cut uh, definition for defining low muscle mass in Indian population. And also, uh, the evidence says that short-term interventions can take a very long time to restore the muscle mass, uh, thereby highlighting uh, the need for adequate follow-up and a long-term intervention by the nutritionist. So these are some of the challenges that we as nutritionists will face. So this is a very beautiful slide, uh, a, a picture which depicts on the left-hand side factors that uh, contribute to depletion of muscle mass, such as aging, hormonal imbalances, altered energy expenditure, low dietary intake, inactivity, and inflammation, which is, again, very common in cancer. And the right side of the image talks about the nutrients or the nutrient considerations that help in maintaining or preserving the muscle mass. So basically, energy needs, uh, we need to give sufficient energy for cancer patients, a high amount of proteins of 1.2 to 1.5, Amino acids and derivatives, especially essential amino acids such as leucine, uh, good amount of EPAs, uh, up to two grams per day, vitamins, especially vitamin D, and a multimodal intervention where we have nutrition, exercise, uh, psychosocial, uh, and uh, pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical uh, interventions as well, such as anabolic or anti-inflammatory agents. Now, this is a slide that uh, Dr. Prabhu has already covered, so I will not deal with it too much. Uh, now, in the presence of uh, diets, so what I, what this slide I'll be discussing about is the different types of diets that we as nutritionists uh, advocate and uh, what is the literature uh, talking about. Now, we should know that exercise uh, alone or hypocaloric diets alone are not effective. So we have to combine diet along with exercise, and that was what the previous slide uh, showed very clearly. So having said that, 
Now we have different types of diets. You have hypocaloric diet with exercise, you have high protein diets, and then you have hypocaloric, high protein diets with exercise. So uh, if you uh, give a patient only hypocaloric diet with exercise, what is noticed is that along with weight loss and loss of uh, fat mass, the skeletal muscle mass is also not preserved. Uh, so we'll have to be careful when we use only hypocaloric diets with exercise. And if you look at high protein diets with exercise, there's very less data because generally high protein diets with exercise are studied in the presence of weight, weight reducing diets. Uh, which again are hypocaloric. So very few studies have uh, done exclusive high protein diets with, ex diets with exercise. Uh, and the few studies that have studied the effects of essential amino acid enriched diet was not significantly proven to improve the muscle mass. So that leaves us with a third type of a diet where you have a hypocaloric diet, a high protein diet with exercise. Now here again, whey-based essential amino acid enriched protein diets with calorie restriction and exercise have been studied. And they have found that skeletal muscle mass may not be lost and uh, may be lost unless adequately supplemented with protein. So proteins is very, very important to supplement uh, to prevent the skeletal muscle mass loss. That is around in the range of 1.2 to 1, I mean 1.1 to 1.2. So the range should be above 1.1. Guidelines say that it should be 1.2 to 1.5 gram per kg body weight. So talking about our experience, so we uh, we just wanted to study uh, our set of patients who come in with breast cancers and evaluate the role of a dietitian led intervention prog program coupled with an exercise regimen to look at clinical outcomes. Now these were breast cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy. We designed it as a prospective longitudinal trial started around Jan 2020. COVID did have its impact on this trial. Uh, but what I'm going to show uh, you now is the preliminary results, which are encouraging. Uh, what we tried to uh, evaluate is body composition analysis, PET CT that was done as part of Onco protocol, hand grip strength to uh, define the muscle strength. We also analyzed fatigue. Now, fatigue is a very, very subjective uh, parameter, agreed. However, a lot of breast cancer patients experience a lot of fatigue, which re results in lack of sleep, decreased nutrition intake, and uh, poor quality of uh, life. And they have been evidence which has correlated sarcopenia and fatigue. So that is a reason why we included fatigue as one of the outcomes uh, to be evaluated. So these are the basic baseline findings. Uh, the mean BMI of our patients was 26.5, which is grade one uh, obesity as per Indian standards. Uh, the percentage muscle mass was 22 as against 24 to 29 as a normal range. The hand grip strength was low, which is only around 17.2 kgs compared to a normal of 24 to 34. The fat percentage was in the high normal range of 32, where the normal range is around 21 to 36. So what were the diet, uh, the nutrition interventions that we did? Now, the nutrition interventions that we did were weight loss specific, where we gave a low carb meal replacement diets. Uh, we also looked at muscle building uh, nutrition, where we looked at where, where we gave uh, high protein whey based uh, uh, supplements with enriched with essential amino acids and omega three. We coupled that with exercise, aerobic and strength training with or without yoga. Now we gave this from baseline to 12 weeks. And the results that I'm sharing now are just preliminary results uh, of this intervention. So the first thing that uh, I would want to highlight is in terms of fatigue. Now, as you can say, the distribution of uh, fatigue as uh, measured by brief fatigue inventory is, uh, you know, there is a marked uh, decline in uh, the, in the uh, incidence or the severity of fatigue due to the nutrition intervention. A very, very encouraging slide because uh, if you uh, meet patients with um, undergoing chemotherapy for breast oncology, a lot of them report a high incidence of fatigue. Now, though this is a subjective parameter, coupled this with objective parameters uh, hopefully should uh, bring in some amount of uh, good literature. Looking at BMI, uh, three months intervention only, so we did not have a market decline in BMI. However, it was in... Uh, it was in, an, in, a, in a reducing trend where uh, patients were reducing weight, though not uh, very high, not a very good significant uh, decline. 
Now, this this again is very encouraging, uh, where we measured the percentage muscle mass in the intervention group. So baseline, we started off at 22 uh, with nutrition and, and, and exercise during chemotherapy, the muscle mass did increase. Now, what we are trying to do at this stage is correlate this with uh, the CT findings uh, to you know make sure that this is this is what actually happened in the body as well. So these are some of the results uh, that uh, we had. So just to summarize, sarcopenia and obesity can coexist among cancer patients. It is very prudent to go beyond body weight and BMI to understand and diagnose sarcopenia. Uh, as uh, uh, emphasized in the previous slides as well, it is not enough just to record the BMI and percentage weight, uh, weight loss. We also have to uh, have some body composition tools to diagnose sarcopenia. High calorie, uh, hypocalorie, high protein diets with exercise might be beneficial in the management of muscle mass in cancer patients. However, the duration of intervention is important to achieve and maintain the desirable results. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Esther. Uh, uh, so uh, can I ask uh, all the speakers to turn on their videos, please? Yep. Uh, there's been quite an interesting audience who've been glued on, uh, as Dr. Uh, Asim said. More than 100 have been regularly, they've been watching it without any drop. So th thank you so much to the participants as well. So uh, 10, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, uh, there are quite a number of questions which has come in. Uh, so can I ask Dr. Prabhu to, to lead the question and uh, maybe we can assign each of us to take the discussion on. Okay. So I said thank you to all the people who still held on on a Friday night, as Dr. Asim mentioned. We still have a very good number, and Esther, you are certainly the best. We reserve the best for the last. So, yeah. <laughs> and we still held on to all the people at the moment. So, yeah. what I start doing is there are some questions popping up. So, I will start as it goes along. So, one of the questions was uh, to ask me if you can take this question. Uh, teenagers with obesity and onco history will be considered for pediatric surgery. So, your opinion on that? Would you? Would your audio is off? Ask me, audio is off. Would you repeat the question? So uh, the question was: uh, Teenagers with obesity and oncology history. I'm not entirely sure the onco history means the patient had onco history or family history. Will they be considered for bariatric surgery? <clears throat> Sorry, I, I. Your first part of the question keeps missing out. Teenager, so a uh, teenager with obesity. Okay. Adolescents. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I would say it in this way that uh, we would basically need to look at, first of all, the whole field of adolescent bariatric surgery in its own is very controversial. Oh, yeah. uh, a lot of people will not practice this. Now we add cancer to it. Um, I don't find any data at all out there to support any such intervention. <clears throat> Given the fact, I would still I would still take it if the child is understanding of what is going on. Um, many parents would be reluctant, but if they buy in and the cancer has a good prognosis, it's an early cancer, then yes, why not? Um, it, it would make sense, but I would say it will really be very difficult to broach that topic with parents. Yeah. They are always protective of their little one, uh, but <clears throat> it may not result in a surgical intervention but may result in a dietary intervention which can uh, hopefully enhance the risk of this patient in the long term. <laughs> yeah that's a perfect answer so just to add to what Dr. Asim said uh, basically when you have teenagers obesity is a very different domain uh, we approach it not just from surgical and uh, dietary but also psychological point of view uh, but now we have cases where very super obese kids have been operated upon uh, so it's very much a tailored uh, uh, what do I say? Opinion which comes at the end. Uh, so that's for that. The so second question was: Does battery surgery reduce the chance of prostate cancer? Uh, I'll just answer that for everybody. I think uh, the awesome also has done it on the chat. Uh, so the evidence is quite mixed. So it depends on which paper you read. Uh, so as I said, we don't do battery surgery to reduce the risk of cancer. So in men, so in women, it's very well proven. So in women, because if you look at all the studies, women were one which had more obesity or overweight at the time of uh, cancer surgery uh, or bariatric surgery, and they've shown to reduce breast cancer risk, endometrial cancer risk. In men, on the other hand, the, the numbers are quite few, and prostate cancer, by definition, usually is a cancer of old age. You know, when you have prostate, it's usually 
60, 70, most of them would not even require surgery. Uh, so the answer is uh, there is some data to say, yes, it may reduce, but we will not use that one point marker to go forward. Uh, so next question, now they're all popping up thick and fast. So Esther, I think you're about quite popular now. Uh, where do I start? Hold on. So uh, uh, Esther, I think that I'll put you two questions at the same time. So first is, uh, I can ask what diet we can advise for a very obese patient with a pancreatic head mass with raised LFT. Um, your audio is off. Audio. You're on mute. <laughs> Okay, so that uh, I'll have to uh, run the diet along with the consultant on what is the modality of treatment that they are planning. Uh, but uh, to uh, broad guidelines will be I will keep it as moderate protein to high protein, uh, not very high protein, uh, moderate fat and uh, sufficient calories. Okay. Uh, Unless uh, Dr. Asim or Dr. Prabhu wants to add on to that. No, that's perfectly said. So, as I said, with LFTs, obviously, you have to be quite careful because yes. you need to correct the LFTs first. Uh, so, if someone's a pancreatic head mass, please correct the LFTs first uh, because if they need peripheral nutrition, there'll be a big challenge. Uh, so, it has to be a combination of work with the surgeon or the oncologist. Then, uh, uh, Dr. Shukumar, are you on? Yes, yes, please tell me. Okay. So, one of the questions is uh, how, so if a radiologist now in clinical practice wants to implement entire two tire three cities about uh, diagnosing sarcopenia. How easy is it? Do they have to go through lots of learning curve or is it quite simple to implement in clinical practice? Uh, I mean, uh, the existing uh, online research tool which is available by the core slicer, it's very easy actually. There's not much of, uh, they even have videos to train uh, people to do the uh, analysis. Okay. Uh, but of course, yes, uh, I mean, it doesn't require a high end CT scan machine to do. Uh, abdominal CT. Yes. We are just looking at a single slice. We are looking at visceral fat, uh, yeah. then uh, muzzle. It, it it is easy. So that's so it's uh, yeah. go out, isn't yeah. it? Analysis analysis part it is uh, pretty easy. Okay. Uh, only thing is you don't have normograms. Probably I would say that you know you sh need to have a baseline. Okay. So okay. the, the message message keep on scanning. Simple. Yeah. Same, quite simple and yeah. straightforward. Exactly. Okay, so that's a take home point. So, next is for both Asim and Esther uh, what sort of diet do you follow uh, post bariatric surgery? With Asim, and I'll get then uh, once you're because it's Singapore opinion and an Indian opinion. So, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm very sure that the Indian and Singapore uh, <laughs> opinion wouldn't differ very much. Uh, it, it, it really depends. If you're talking in the realm of oncometabolic surgery, it will really depend what you need to achieve for your patients. As I said, there will be some patients who would be below the threshold. You need to build them up. But what, as uh, Esther has already pointed out, what you need to build up is their lean body mass and not put fats on them, okay? Just making them fat and plumb by increasing the fat makes no difference to who they are. So you, what you need to deal with is their sarcopenia, so a diet which is high in protein, and again, obviously, it will depend on the type of cancer we're treating. Are we treating breast cancer, endometrial cancer, gastric cancer? So the variation has to be tweaked and tailored to the need of the patient. If you're dealing with breast cancer, uh, if the patient is sarcopenic, you give more protein diet, get them to exercise and increase. So the patients, uh, which is interesting, and we will discuss that with Esther in a while. But Esther, over to you to answer this question. So Esther, before you answer, okay. I'll just add a supplement yeah. question, which is creep chain. So proteins need okay. food energy for the metabolism. So if we give yes. low calorie diet, uh, will it be beneficial to give high amount of proteins in it? So that almost answers the tag along question. Okay. Yeah, so if you're looking at a low calorie diet, uh, as, uh, as I showed in the slides, for cancer patients, we don't put them on a very calorie restricted diet. So uh, we will range it between 20 to 25 calorie per kg body weight, especially if the cancer patient is undergoing treatment. Uh, in that in in that presence of 20 to 25 calorie per kg body weight, we give them high proteins, which is up to 1.2 grams to start off with. If well tolerated, up to 1.5 gram per kg body weight. So uh, that is that's to answer the question. So if you had just an obesity patient itself, uh, is there a huge difference? We uh... yes. So 
if uh, if we have only an obese patient without uh, in the without the presence of cancer then we can try some very low calorie diets uh, looking at compliance then modify it but in the presence of cancer very low calorie diets are not advised okay so one more question to esther which they asked you by name so how did you measure muscle mass in in the study we have done in hcg okay so we measured we had a body we have a body composition analyzer we have a portable one and a fixed one of in body uh, so we use that to measure the percentage uh, muscle mass and the percentage fat mass okay and the compartment so, so dr shukma just to add there's another question which is also a tag along so if you do intervention with aerobic and resistance training is there a difference between muscle hypertrophy and muscle strength so could you appreciate any muscle hypertrophy on the ct scans or not yeah i mean you in if you have a baseline scan yes we can do that i mean and one static image if you ask me what has happened and i'll i'll probably not be able to tell you what exactly is going on okay. uh, if 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 you want to look at any of this intervention related uh, studies uh, we need to have a baseline scan either at least a simple ultrasound at one good area where you think that this particular muscle is going to uh, you know uh, become hypertrophied at we, sh we should have normograms for that and then take it okay so we just should, we have a base, we should have so just to highlight to the question basically we use radiological uh, findings and also we use muscle grip strength now obviously muscle grip strength is more of the forearm and the hand muscle but not necessarily the iliopsoas component which is really just uh, so that's where i would end up uh next question uh, dr asim you want to take it from which bmi will you recommend bariatric surgery for a 19 year old so we're just talking about bariatric but no cancer from which bmi um if you look at the asian cohort which we all follow the asia pacific guidelines is 32.5 with two comorbidities or 37.5 uh, kilograms per meter square without any comorbidities okay. so that's a straightforward answer uh so one more question esther was uh, can we do studies on the in body 370 they were asking for our for our study <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, yeah you can do studies on any any standardized body composition analyzer i'm not promoting any any company here but you have options uh, of different types of body composition analyzers use what is possible for your uh, setting but i would encourage all the nutritionists who are in this forum to start using body composition analyzers uh, to understand uh, the sarcopenia and cancer uh, just in support of what esther said i think it's important because all hello so is it from the patient perspective as well as show them the results you know when patients come to you after 3 months or 6 months you have an objective way so any of the bc machines puts out a report So when you show it to them, they, they're quite happy with what the outcome is. Uh, so that's where I think uh, we stand. Um, are there any more questions uh, popping up? So I think uh, we, we will just go for one final round of questions. Is that okay, uh, Raghu? And hello, I think Raghu's also got stuck. So I think um, we, we, we are approaching Raghu. end time. I can uh, you can hear me, sir. Yeah, now we can hear Raghu. Yep. So what I was trying to say was I think I've thoroughly enjoyed other speakers' talk. It was all something quite new, um, and we all have a viewpoint. But I think now we can see the world moving towards the obesity pandemic, which is going to hit us all hard. And also, we are going to uh, address this as a multi-disciplinary team. That's the main take-home message. It's just not the surgeon, just not the radiologist, but have a good team in workplace. Uh, so take-home point from me is obviously start recognizing sarcopenic obesity, uh, assess it, recognize it. And make sure you have things in your armory which you can treat accordingly. Okay. Uh, Dr. Asim, it's your 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 take home point. So for me, it is that um, conventional procedures uh, can be modulated to deal uh, with metabolic issues, uh, not only in preventing cancers, uh, but also in treating metabolic diseases in these patients. And that's a great outcome that we can achieve. Uh, kill two birds in one stone. Or we think about it. If you don't have it at the back of your mind, you will never do it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar, from uh, from uh, from your point of view, the one who has an objective way of assessing sarcopenia going forward. Dr. Shiv Kumar, would you like to switch on your video? Yeah, I think uh, there's some uh, light issue. That's that's the okay. reason why I. 
I didn't okay. switch, okay. switch on. I'm still in the hospital, so okay. uh, uh, I mean, if uh, Prabhu, uh, can you just uh, repeat the question? You know, I was saying that from so going in the future, uh, because radiologists, you're, you're, you're possibly the most objective way of assessing sarcopenia going forward. Uh, yes. So, uh, what would your take home messages to be any radiologist who's logged on, uh, who is keen to get involved in assessing this in their practice? Uh, what, what would you just say some final words for them? I think uh, people should start looking uh, uh, sarcopenia angle also. Whenever they get any diagnostic CTs, especially the abdominal scans, uh, you know, they just don't have to uh, report whatever the routine being asked. It's good that, you know, especially if patient has come for a follow-up, uh, always keep a baseline ready report yeah. for the sarcopenia. You, you, you take the measurements and you can always start if you start doing more and more then only we will be we will be able to better it okay. it, it should become a routine habit yes make, make it a habit to assess that's that's good point i think really you should start possibly giving the reports itself that you know we think there's a sarcopenia element uh, when they do the patient so i said the final word rests with you because obviously a lot of these patients uh, we do operate or we they do chemo they all come to you at the end uh, so just to highlight the importance of both sarcopenia treatment and obesity treatment in the same setting uh, so your final thoughts yeah my final thoughts or uh, words to uh, encourage the team of nutritionists have a follow-up plan because in many of our centers we do not have follow-up with our patients we have one time meeting and we give a we hand out a diet chart and then we leave uh, we really don't have a follow-up mechanism in many indian centers uh, so it's an encouragement to have a follow-up protocol with your patients so that you're able to monitor what uh, the compliance to the diet that you have given, especially important for cancer patients. Uh, so that's that's my uh, thought process at this time. Okay. So I think uh, from the speaker's point of view, I would like to thank uh, Team Nestle. You know, you've done a great job in assembling us on a platform and obviously highlighting something which is uh, possibly going to raise its head more in the future and obviously we are trying to show that we can have a good clinical outcome uh, using both diet or surgery exercise one way or the other um, and I leave the final words to you uh, Raghu. Thank you so much sir. Uh, I think it's been uh, close to two months uh, this program has been on the making. Uh, thank you so much I think uh, uh, for having a multidisciplinary uh, full topic which is it, which, which gives a complete roundabout view of uh, sarcopenic obesity and the remissions which were spoken about. Very encouraging. A lot of thoughts I am sure team uh, all the participants would have taken home from this uh, program. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so just to add the final thoughts on this sir uh, all the participants especially for the participants you'll be getting a link please give your feedback you'll get your certificates signed by all the speakers for this session uh, so uh, thank you so much uh, for making this uh, session a very successful one sir uh, to all the speakers uh, dr prabhu uh, dr shivkumar dr ashim dr esther thank you so much uh, for making this uh, weekend uh, program very successful i think without this content and the topic what you spoke about we wouldn't have come uh, had so many parties come uh, had so many participants in this program yeah. so uh, thanks for that and i'd like to thank on behalf of uh, our cluster head uh, uh, for sar region mr abdul hanan for uh, uh, for getting this uh, program on and the and the backup support which we got from our head office team as well thanks to everyone who've been working on the background for this session and uh, a happy weekend to all of you uh, stay safe yes stay Bye -bye. safe Thank you.